So without further ado, uh, I'm pleased to present Lynn Fuston, who is, uh, who is a recording engineer for, your bio says, uh, almost four decades, which is impossible because you're like 30. And the, thank you. So thank I don't know you. how that works. But. I appreciate the compliment. I'll pay you later. Oh, great. Uh, so uh, with a background in the studio in Nashville, dealing with artists like Amy Grant, Michael J. Smith, um, Lynn knows what he's talking about. So without further ado, let's get into the presentation. Lynn Fuston, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, to start off with, let me find out how many people know. Uh, I want to find out how many people have how many microphones. I right, always start this way. So uh, one to five microphones. OK, that's good. Uh, five to 10. OK, that's good. Uh, let's say 10 to 20. OK, and then the rest, show of hands for how many don't know how many microphones you have. Oh, come on, I can't be the only, OK, there's three of us, exactly. I was going to say, I haven't counted in a while. Uh, you may be wondering, my name is Lynn Fuston. I am the manager of written content at Sweetwater, and I oversee an editorial team uh, that provides content. And you may be like, why do you have a man an editor up here talking about microphones? I did spend 40 years in Nashville uh, as a recording engineer. Uh, the things that I will be remembered for, I'm a recording engineer, a photographer, and now working at Sweetwater for four years. The things that I will be remembered for, got a couple of pictures over on the screen, uh, did a microphone shootout back in 2000. We put 49 microphones up side by side and then had two singers sing through each one of them. So that people, what I found is that people in Nashville had access to a lot of microphones, but there were people all over the world who did not have access to as many microphones. And people would say, so how does it, how's a 251 compared to a C12 compared to a 47? And I was like, well, you just put them all in the same room and listen to them. And they were like, e that sounds easy, but we can't do that. So this is why we did that. I did the same thing with preamps uh, two different times. I did 34 preamps one time. I did 24 preamps one time. This is what it looked like when we piled them all in the control room. Just to give you a little bit of background, uh, I've compared ribbon microphones. Uh, we compared sax microphones. And this is a meme that you may have seen on the internet. Uh, we compared snare microphones. We actually put 26 microphones on a snare drum for people to hear the differences between those. But my goal today is to take you from this to that, okay? So we're gonna move really fast. So for Microphones 101, let me start off. What is a microphone? A microphone is a transducer. Basically, it just converts sound waves to electricity. It's just that easy. Uh, we'll go through how the diaphragms work in the different types of microphones. You may know this or you may not. A part of the reason I like to start so fundamentally is I was in recording for probably 10 to 15 years and I thought I had a pretty good handle on what different microphones did and then I discovered other microphones and I was like, man, oh, I wish I'd known this 10 years ago. This would have been perfect. So, but basically, each microphone is a different filter. It, it, it's like a different lens on a camera. It accomplishes different things. One of the other things that I, I want to get around to by the time we finish is what is the perfect microphone? And how many, how many people have discovered the perfect microphone? Anybody yet? Okay, good. Me neither. Okay, so the different types of microphones. Dynamics, ribbons, condensers. Not gonna spend any time on crystal mics or carbon mics. You may have used them, I've used them. We don't see them that much anymore. Start with dynamic mics. I'm going to move really, really fast. So if you're taking notes, I apologize. Uh, but I want to get. I want to let y'all hear these microphones. Dynamic microphones. Sound waves strike a diaphragm. There is a coil that sits inside a magnetic field. If you move a wire through a magnetic field, it induces a current. So basically, this operates like a speaker in reverse. When the diaphragm moves in and out. There's a current that's created that corresponds to that. So that's a dynamic microphone. Uh, basically, the, the two wires come from the outputs of those coils that are wrapped around that magnet. Inside every one of these dynamic microphones, it looks exactly like this. And the diaphragm may be small, it may be large. Uh, 
it may be printed, it may be 3D printed. It, there's all kinds of different microphones. I mean, all kinds of different diaphragms. So that's dynamic mics. Examples of dynamic mics, SM57, probably the, the most well-known microphone in the world. It's, I work at Sweetwater and I see the numbers for how many we sell. And we always joke because it's like, where do, where do these all go? I mean, does everybody replace all their 57s every year? Because, I mean, there are just thousands flying, and it's like, are there really that many people that don't have microphones? And it, it's just astounding how many 57s we go through. And the reason why, it's a great microphone. This is another one, the SM7B. Uh, we've seen, uh, especially with, with podcasters and VO work, this is an incredibly popular microphone. You would be shocked at how many of these microphones we sell. Not an inexpensive microphone, but it is one of the most revered broadcast dynamic microphones in the industry. Sennheiser 421, another standard. It's been around forever. Similar as far as, well, it's not that similar as far as usefulness goes. Similar, well, it's not even that similar. Uh, it's got some features that the 57 doesn't have. Uh, I won't talk about the, the microphone clip. Anybody that's, how many people have owned a 421? Okay, how many, how many people have been frustrated with the clip? Okay, everybody that owns one. Okay, fine, we'll skip that part. Uh, this is the SE Electronics V-Kick of the new dynamic microphones when, I will just be real honest, when SE said, hey, we're gonna, they've, they've been making condenser microphones for a long time. When they said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna release some new dynamic microphones, uh, V series, the the seven, the eight. Uh, I'm sorry, not the eight. Uh, the V7, the V kick. Inside, I just like, oh yeah, great. What the world needs another dynamic handheld microphone. They are really exceptional microphones. I hope you'll find SE and get a chance to listen to them. If if not, this microphone. I have a demo of kick drum microphones that we did comparing all the standards that everybody knows, RE20, the 421, uh, the Beta 52, and we compared it to this microphone, it was, we're really pleasantly surprised. It's very, very affordable. Uh, it's got switches, we'll get into that later. Next microphone, ribbon microphones. I, I put this second, even though popularity-wise, it probably would be third. Uh, I put it second because ribbon microphones are actually dynamic microphones. Uh, I did not bring my prop up here. Are y'all familiar with the, the operating principle for a ribbon microphone? Okay. I, I want to spend a good bit of time, well not a good bit of time, I don't have a good bit of time. I want to spend some time on ribbons because ribbons were one of those things that I didn't discover until I was probably 15 years into my recording career. And those were one of those things that I said, man, oh, this, I wish I'd had this a long time ago. For things, uh, for instruments like brass, for instruments like percussion, uh, there are all kinds of applications. And the natural figure of eight, which a lot of people look at and think of as a limitation, it's, it's astounding. Once you understand what it can do and the problems that it can solve, it, they are amazing. Okay, so ribbon microphones. Uh, let, basically, you've got a magnet, and inside that magnetic field, you can see the, the north and the south pole. Inside that magnetic field, there is a membrane that hangs down, a very, very thin, like thinner than a human hair membrane. And as the, most people think that it moves like a dynamic microphone, uh, where the, the membrane you actually, the sound pressure, I mean, the, the sound waves hit it and it moves. What it actually senses is the difference in pressure between the front and the back. And the reason that ribbon microphones are naturally figure of eight is because if I had a sheet of paper, which I meant to bring, uh, if you think of a sheet of paper here, if you're talking across it, the pressure on this side is identical to the pressure on this side. It basically, you become invisible to the microphone when you're off axis. And what I demonstrate, and what I will demonstrate for y'all today, is most people think that it's like, it's sensitive here and it's less sensitive over here, almost like a, a cardioid microphone. The truth is, it's sensitive in the front and it's sensitive in the back, 
and it's it's completely gone. I mean, it disappears. The only thing you hear when you're talking off axis uh, on a ribbon microphone is the reflections that are coming from somewhere else because it will not pick up anything. So let me show you real world. This is, uh, this is the diaphragm. I don't think this is a 44, I don't remember. These are vintage mi ribbon microphones. Ribbons were uh, created in the 30s by RCA. This is what they used to look like when we had bigger magnetic structures before we had neodymium magnets. This is what a, a more contemporary magnet structure will look like because we have more powerful magnets. We don't have to have a microphone that weighs eight pounds. We can pack it into uh, a body the size of a, a 121, a Royer, or the size of the R84. These are classic, uh, when, when you say microphones, the image that comes to most people's mind is either a 57 or, you know, vintage microphones. The 44 is probably it. The 44 and the 77 are what most people are gonna think. The icons on your computer for, for, for microphones probably look like these. That's a 44BX. You've seen it everywhere. You've seen it on Sinatra. You've seen it on Elvis. You've seen it in, in all kinds of classic recordings. The amazing thing about those is they have such an incredibly natural sound. And uh, a lot of times you, you did not see them. You'll watch old TV shows from the 50s and 60s, or maybe even, well, no, we didn't have TV. But you'll see 50s and 60s, and what a lot of times they do is they would boom the microphone up out of the picture, and the microphone is literally seven to 10 feet away from the performer. Watch some of these old shows, and you'll go, okay, he's not wearing a wireless, he's not holding the handheld. It sounds like I'm standing right next to him, and that's because there's a ribbon mic 10 feet away up above. It's angled so that you're not hearing any of the, the noise from the machinery, but you're hearing that person's capture, that voice, and it sounds like you're standing right next to him, even though they're 10 feet away from him. A lot of these microphones would not do that, could not do that. So anyway, when you watch old TV shows, be aware of that. These are some other examples. Vintage mics, 77 DXs. How many people have owned a 77? A vintage 77? Okay, we've got a couple. I, I was very fortunate. I ran across one that was one of the last ones they ever made from the late 60s. And it looked like it was brand new. Somebody had it in the case. And I, I was, felt very fortunate to have it. It was, it was amazing. This is not one of mine. Most of them usually look like that one on the left because they've gotten dropped. Okay, modern ribbons. The Sure, this was designed by uh, Crowley and Tripp, bought by Sure. The KSM 353 is a modern ribbon. The R121, any R121 owners? Okay, killer microphones. I've got a pair of 122s. Uh, and then the, R, the R84, made by Wes Dooley. Great microphone. Uh, let's talk about condenser microphones. How am I doing time-wise? Okay, I'm good. Condenser microphones. Sound waves hit. Oh, I forgot my visual aid. I brought, actually, I brought condenser capsules with me to pass around, and I don't have them here. Um, they are, they are actually in the Sweetwater booth. Could you go grab those? Because I would love. I went years without knowing what the inside of a condenser looked like. Let me show you real fast. He's going to go get one of these. This is what the condenser microphone looks You may have looked through the grill of a microphone or shined the light up in there to see what it looks like. Let me explain a little bit about the operating principle. In, uh, in England, they call them capacitor microphones. We call them condenser microphones. It basically is a capacitor. It operates like a capacitor. The sound waves, there are a back plate and a diaphragm. The sound waves strike the diaphragm and when it moves, it moves closer and farther away from the back plate in you know correlating with the sound so as it does that the capacitance uh, how, how many of you have electrical backgrounds you know what capacitors are what they do okay good um, basically as as those the membrane and the back plate get closer and farther away as it's dancing with the sound wow that's loud 
um, as it's dancing with the sound, it causes, it creates a current that correlates with the sound that's hitting it. Uh, the battery that is here powers, provides the current for that. There's either, in condenser microphones, there either will be a battery internally. Uh, I don't know if you have any battery powered microphones. Uh, or frequently, uh, that will come from an external power supplier, either Phantom 48, or in the case of a tube mic, it can come from the external power supply. Oh, no, they're not there. You know what? Nobody there knows anything. Okay, Sorry. <laughs> don't worry about it, that's fine. Okay, so this is what the inside of a condenser capsule looks like. Again, very, very thin membrane, my membrane. Uh, usually mylar, gold sputter to make it, uh, to make it uh, conductive. If you've ever, this is a center tap on the one on the left. If you think of it, uh, the best analogy I can give you is think of a drum head. Okay, so when you put the head on the drum, you clamp it down, but it's just, it's loose. So what you do is you tighten it and to create an even tension across the head. If you see these screws, basically what they do, if you see these screws around that one to the left, what they do is they'll tighten the membrane until it's the right tension, and then they screw those down to hold it tight. And so, it, but it responds as opposed to a snare drum, which responds when you hit it with a, with a stick. Or if you've ever talked into a snare drum, you'll notice that the vibrations from your voice will cause it to move. This is the same thing, except it's just tiny and thin, so they can respond to frequencies up to 20, 30, 50K. Uh, the one to the right is a small diaphragm condenser. That's a, uh, I believe that's a KM84. Here are common examples. U87AI. How many people own 87s or have owned 87s? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one shortly. This is a, the 87 is a, is a classic. It's been around for a long time. This is a new version that you may or may not have seen. This operates, same principle, has a completely different diaphragm. Uh, if I open this one up, you would see it look, the diaphragm looks like a window pane. It actually is rectangular diaphragms. There's four of them, one, two, three, four. So what it does is it ends up with a net surface area that's about twice as big as the 87. It's huge, and it gives it all kinds of interesting properties. I'll tell you more about that. I, actually, I'm just going to demonstrate what it'll do later. Small diaphragm condensers, SM81, very, very popular used worldwide for all kinds of orchestral applications, drum overheads, it excels. Uh, another condenser microphone, Sennheiser MKH-416, shotgun microphones. How many people have worked with shotgun microphones? Okay, good. I didn't discover shotgun microphones till way too late in my career, and now I use them all the time. Uh, Beta 87A. Uh, a lot of people are under the mistaken impression that anything that's handheld is a dynamic. It's just not so. The 87A is a condenser that's handheld. There are a lot of handheld condensers. This is another condenser microphone, uh, the new Shure Twinplex that they just introduced. It's an amazing microphone. I'm going to let you hear that one. Okay, moving along. What are the characteristics of microphones? I'm just going to cover this real quickly. Here they are. Directional pattern, style, specifications, and then other considerations. And this is where we'll get into, you know, what's the perfect microphone. And it, again, it's sort of like the perfect microphone for what? It's like when people say, if you could only buy one microphone, it's like it just it, it depends on what you're trying to do. Because if you only want one, vi one vocal mic to work in the studio, it would be this. But if you want one microphone that you're going to take to a desert island and it needs to last for 50 years and you're not going to have power, it's going to be a completely different microphone. And I've done the desert island thing, so I'll, I'm, I'll tell you that story in a second. Okay, let's talk about directional patterns. Everybody knows about directional patterns, right? I, well, you know what? I'm not going to assume anything. Okay, omnidirectional. I used to do this presentation. I'd do it with a beach ball, okay? An omni microphone picks up in front, in back, sides, people look at a microphone like this and go, you know, there, it, it can't pick up all the way around because there's stuff in the way. And it's like, well, it actually does. The characteristics may change as it goes around the microphone, 
but it picks up equally well in every direction. Cardioid, the heart pattern. To me, it looks more like a kidney bean. Cardioid basically picks up from the front and the sides, rejects from the rear. Next, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was on the wrong slide. I was looking at the preview. Have I been doing that the whole time? Oh, okay. Okay, cardioid. Hypercardioid. Hypercardioid is more directional to the front. So you will see, uh, you will hear things here, you will hear things here, but it won't wrap around to the sides. It drops off more quickly on the sides. The trade-off for that is that there's typically a lobe in the back. To get the rejection here at 45 degrees off axis in the rear, or 135 degrees in the rear, there's a lobe in the back. And depending on the microphone, it can be slight or it can be severe. Something you need to be aware of. It, uh, I had a situation one time where somebody said, I always use hypercardioids on the toms because they have such great rejection from the rear. And I said, well, that's, that's good. Do you ever have any problems with the cymbals bleeding in? And they were like, oh, always. The cymbals are terrible. And I was like, do you know why that is? And they were like, well, it actually works better than a regular cardioid. And I was like, yeah, except right back here where, behind the microphone where the cymbals are because it's picking up equally as well it's picking up the symbols probably more than it's picking up the tom and they were like no and i was like yeah try it and again so that's the trade-off the advantage when you're using them on stage specifically if someone has their monitors at 45 and 135 would that be right yeah okay so when somebody's singing those monitors will be rejecting if they're in a situation where they've got one monitor in front of them and they're holding the microphone like this, not such a good idea. You might be better off with a different microphone. So, bi-directional, figure eight. Uh, this is drawn, it looks sort of flat. Uh, the amazing thing about ribbon microphones is that they really, really will pick up almost equally across the front of the microphone. They'll be less directional in my experience and then when you get to the sides, it just completely goes away. And then in the back, you'll have exactly the same thing. Now, so how many people think that ribbon microphones sound different on the back than on the front? There's gotta be somebody, seriously? Okay, well then that's good, because that's a myth I like to bust. Uh, Royer has designed their microphones where the ribbon is offset in the gap, so that when you have the 121, facing you, it sounds one way. If you flip it around the other way, it's actually brighter. And a lot of people think that ribbon mics are always brighter on the back. Royer's done a great job with their marketing, uh, you know, communicating that message. You know, it just doesn't apply to every ribbon microphone. So some people think that's true. Not shotgun mics, unidirectional microphones amazing, amazing problem solvers. Again, they have their own limitations, uh, but they're incredibly useful. We, we were setting up yesterday and there was, there was a big lift right here and it was beeping, it was beeping, it was beeping, making, make, driving us crazy. I had the Omni mic on. Uh, we listened to the figure eight and we got to the shotgun and uh, Wayne, my Sam man over there, everybody say, thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, and we was like, I'm not sure that mic is working because I, I don't hear anything. And it's like, well, no, it's doing what it's supposed to do. You can hear me, but you just can't hear the lift, which is beeping right here. So they're incredible. I'll, I'll go on about that in a second. So to identify a microphone, don't read these left to right. Basically, we've got three different heads that are on the microphone. Then there's the pattern for the microphone. And then the other thing that we haven't even touched on is the amplifier. Uh, you can have active dynamics, you can have solid state. Uh, so basically you just pick one from the first category, pick one from the second category, and pick one from the third category. And it's gonna fall into one of those. And there's all kinds of different applications. There are active ribbons, uh, there are passive ribbons, there are active dynamic microphones. So you just need to be aware of all this. Microphone styles, just run real briefly through these. Stand mount, 
microphones, handheld microphones, we all know what those are. Lapel microphones like this one are a headset microphone and then instrument-specific instrument microphones. It's too early to be saying that. I'm gonna run through these real briefly and then we're gonna get on to listening to these microphones. Stand mounted mics. These are ones that you would probably never ever hold in your hand. Either A, because they're too sensitive or B, because they're too large. The blue bottle, the red, uh, the Warm 251, the Manly Ref Cardioid. Those are examples of microphones that work really well in the studio. Handheld mics, we all know what those are. Miniature microphones, this again is the Twinplex. Uh, headset, lapel microphones. They're great for certain applications, especially if you need to hide a microphone. Uh, they can get down to the size of a pencil lead and you can hide it in a plant. Instrument specific, the DPA range of microphones is incredible for these. The 4099s, if you've not played with these, uh, they're unbelievable for acoustic guitar, uh, for violin, for all kind of wind instruments, trumpet, things like that. For uh, they even make them with uh, magnetic mounts for pianos, where you actually just drop it and it sticks to the soundboard. I mean, actually, uh, not not the soundboard. It sticks to the frame, the metal frame, and you can just put them wherever you want. Incredible for that. Um, Another, another example is a subkick, which is basically a speaker that's inverted to turn it into a microphone. Okay, let's talk about characteristics. And I'm gonna run out of time. I'm gonna skip through some of this. Characteristics, frequency response, frequency response everybody knows what that is, I hope. Uh, interpreting the frequency response chart, basically what you're looking for is dips and peaks, where it rolls off, uh, this one, if you see the dotted line, that is a high pass filter. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. And then you can see at the top end on this 4041, there's a little bit of bump at the top. But it, for the most part, it's pretty flat compared to the SM57, which is anything but flat by design. Uh, they have rolled off everything below 100 hertz, and that's you know, not because they want it to sound like that, it's because when you handle it, they don't want it, you, it'll diminish handling noise. The presence peak, or the bird beak as we call it, four to five K gives us that presence. And then what it lacks in low frequency response, it makes up in proximity effect, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. So the closer you get to the microphone, the more the low end is boosted. Uh, frequency response, this is just comparing the SM7B, which has switchable uh, frequency contours to the 57. If you switch the SM7B to, uh, so that the mid boost is in and the high pass is on, it sounds pretty close to a 57. But if you flip them the other way, it's a completely different microphone. Uh, the 5040. Audio-Technica 5040, which is this fifth microphone here, almost flat. One of the things I was telling you about is uh, the, the patterns and the directionality. One of the things I want to demonstrate for you is it's a cardioid microphone, but look at, do you see that, that center dotted line that looks like the smallest ball? It's the one that's 8K. If you look at that, what that means is that at 8K, it basically is only seeing in front of the microphone. So if you're off to the side, if you see the solid line, the 1K, if you're off 90 degrees, you know, you're only going to be down 5 dB. But at 8K, if you look at it, at 8K, when you're 90 degrees off axis, there's, there's basically nothing there. And those are the kind of things that you need to know about your microphone before you put it up. When I, when I first got this microphone to try out, I tried it on lead vocals, absolutely loved it. I was like, great, we left it up, went to do background vocals, had somebody standing here, somebody standing here, and somebody standing here. You know what it sounded like? It sounded like a lead vocalist because you couldn't hear the other people on the sides. It's incredibly advantageous if you're in a room where you're gonna, it's gonna be bright and you've got reflections that you wanna get rid of and all you really wanna hear is what's in front of that microphone and you want it to sound like a large diaphragm condenser, but you've got to solve these other problems. You'll hear that. I'll demonstrate that for you. Uh, 
Maximum SPL, this is another characteristic that you just need to be aware of. Uh, self noise, I'm gonna move real fast through these. Uh, the other things, and I will show you this, handling noise, susceptibility to wind noise, uh, those are things that are characteristics that you need to be aware of. Proximity effect, I was not aware of how severe proximity effect can be. Uh, how many people know, how many people don't know what proximity effect is? Anybody? Okay. Proximity effect in a, uh, in a cardioid microphone, it's the characteristic for the low frequencies to be boosted as you get closer to the microphone. On some microphones, it can start five or six inches away. Say for instance on this 57. On some microphones, the RCA 44 that I showed you earlier, proximity effect on that one starts four feet away. So if you are closer than this to that microphone, there is an artificial low frequency boost. So that's why when people say ribbon microphones sound dark, when you get right up on that ribbon microphone and you're like this, like six inches away like you would work a large diaphragm condenser, you're boosting the low end by 20, 25 dB. So it's like no wonder it sounds so dark. If you want it to sound natural, stand back here. So anyhow, this is what proximity effect looks like. Uh, the center line is when you're a third of a meter away. As you get closer, that low frequency boost increases. As you get farther away, the low frequencies decrease. This is, uh, I just brought this for example, this is the beta 87. Frequency response is the solid line. As you get closer, you can see what it does. I mean, it, it boosts frequencies all the way up to 7 800 hertz. So it's not like just the low end. It's a massive impact. And you can see at 100 hertz when you move in, if you're at one centimeter, you've got 12 dB more at 100 hertz. And I mean, think about that if you're EQing a vocal. It's a massive impact. Variables on certain microphones. High pass filters. I'm gonna go through these fast. On the right, those are high pass filters where you can actually switch them in to get rid of wind noise or handling noise, rumble from a stage. Uh, pads, the top on that Shure microphone. Pads, basically, if you've got a sound signal that is too loud and it's overloading the microphone, you can switch it in there. Some people think, well, why would you need that? You just turn the preamp down. And it's like, well, no, it doesn't work because if, if it's overloading inside the microphone, it doesn't matter how far you turn the preamp down. It's still overloaded before it gets to the preamp. Usually that's switchable. What you gain is headroom. What you lose is noise. Did I say that right? If you switch it in, the noise comes up and the headroom goes up as well. Variable patterns, another option that you've got. Uh, we've run through the patterns. You'll use each when you need it. Variable frequency response. This is going back to the V-Kick microphone. Classic modern in the mid-range, classic modern on the top end. These are, those are switches right on the back of the microphone. This is what they actually do to the frequency response of the microphone. You can see it's like having a, a built-in EQ. And it's am the amount of control and the number of different sounds that you can get out of that one microphone just by flipping that switch or those two switches, pretty amazing. Uh, pop filters, shock mounts will solve problems in different situations. Everybody knows what a pop filter is. We've got the foam type, we've got the stand type. Shock mounts are great all kinds of everything from the, the jelly donut ring to the, the, you know, the spider clamps. Choosing the perfect microphone. There really is no perfect microphone. There are perfect microphones for certain applications, but there really is not one microphone that is perfect for everything. Uh, so let me give you one example and then we're gonna get into sounds. Uh, I went to Ghana and we auditioned microphones before we went. I went over there to record the Fisk Jubilee Singers and they couldn't tell me what venue we were gonna be in. This was challenging because we were traveling halfway around the world. They didn't know what venue, they knew what city we were gonna be in and they knew what location, but they didn't know the venue. So we auditioned a bunch of microphones. We chose the microphones that would be, that I thought would be best. 
We carried seven cases over there, set up in this castle, which was built in 1482, which did have very, very sketchy power that was installed sometime in the 20th century. We got there, and what I had done a lot of research, I thought I knew what venue we were going to be in. We ended up in the courtyard. And when we started to load in and get everything out of the van, they were like, who are y'all? And we were like, well, we're the group that came 7,000 miles from America to perform here today. And they were like, we, we, we had no idea you were coming. So we ended up in the courtyard outside, different situation than I anticipated. I ended up setting up in one of the dungeons so that I could actually be out of the sun. This is a picture of what the recording setup looked like. If I had known what we were going to do, uh, I would have chosen different microphones. The things that we ended up encountering, wind, massive wind. I mean, this is looking over the edge of the castle. It's like looking straight out at the Atlantic. Wind, crows, the sound of the surf. We got there, they said, uh, well, we do tours. And we were like, well, can you not do tours while we're recording? And they were like, no. And we were like, really? So they were conducting tours around us while we were recording. What are you gonna do? So knowing how to use the mics can solve a lot of problems. Knowing the situation that you're gonna be in is critical. If you don't know what situation you're gonna be in, you just can't have too many microphones. You just honestly cannot. I would have given my eye teeth for, in that situation, either a pair of shotguns or a handful of 58s instead of the condensers that I had. Uh, was not an option at that time. Again, we were, we were traveling as lightly as we could. So now I want to listen. These are the microphones that I have lined up. I want to scoot through these. I've got about eight minutes left. Uh, so I am going to start here with microphone number one. We're going to turn this off. So all you will be hearing is this microphone. And they are, I think they're listed all over there. I had a call on Audible. I changed a couple. I believe this is correct. Okay, so let's go to the 57. Okay, this is an SM57, and everybody knows what this microphone sounds like. It's... Wow. Okay. Uh, thankfully, it has a big old high pass at 100 hertz, so that could have been a lot louder than it was. Okay, cardioid microphone. Everybody knows the sound of this microphone. You can hear the presence boost. If I get over here... You know, it's it's pretty much pretty much flat. You'll hear it, okay, coming over here, it starts to drop off. And then now when I get over here, you can barely hear it at all. In the back of the microphone, if I talk into the back, you can't hear anything. Okay, so that is the SM57. Number two, this is the Sennheiser 421. You hear any difference in the sound? Yeah, it's quite a bit. Uh, one of the great, now these are very, very similar microphones. They're both dynamics, they're both cardioids. One of the cool things about this is it's got a built in high pass filter. So this one, it's built in and it's fixed. This one is variable. Okay, it goes from music to voice. So this is music and it's five stages. So I'm going to talk. It sounds like this. This is the next position. This is position number three. This is position number four. And this is position number five. Now, to exaggerate this, this I'm going to go from five to one. Five, from your angle, is is like this. So this is number five with the high pass really, really high. And this is number one with the high pass out. It's pretty obvious. Uh, if you're doing something where you've got the mic very, very close, and the proximity effect is eating your lunch, then you can pull this in. As you get closer. Again, it's just a way to taper the sound. It's very, very convenient. The thing to know about this microphone is when you put it up, check that switch. Because if you put it up on somebody and you're hoping that you can make them sound like the voice of God and that is in position number five, it ain't going to happen. You need it in this position, okay? So it's pretty obvious. Okay. Number three, this is the sure. Let me not. This is a condenser microphone. This is the Beta 181 with a super cardioid capsule on it. You can hear immediately the difference as far as susceptibility to pops. You know, uh, it's much more susceptible. 
Uh, it's not designed to be handheld. Okay, this is, I, I told you about the super cardioid. I want you to listen. This, uh, I don't think how's it? Oh, the easiest way to do this, I'll do it this way. Okay, this is the front of the microphone, and this is the back of the microphone. Okay, you can still hear me as opposed to the 57. This is the back of the microphone, this is the front of the microphone. Okay, now let me show you. Uh, let me just show you as I get off axis. Y'all can see this. So do you hear that coming back in? So that shows you the lobe in the back. Okay, I've got five more minutes. Okay, this is the Neumann U87 AI. One of the probably, this is probably the preeminent vocal mic in the world. Uh, has a very, very characteristic sound. Beautiful sound, large diaphragm condenser. This has pad, this also has a high pass multi-pattern. Um, basically, I just put it up here because it's pretty much the king of microphones. So, uh, everybody would recognize the sound of this microphone. You've probably heard this microphone more than any in just in the history of recording, for studio recording. It's a great microphone, still being manufactured. I'm going to go now to the 5040. This is the Audio-Technica 5040. You can hear it sounds quite a bit different. This is the one that has the four window pane diaphragms. I want, I want to show you, again, with the high frequencies, I want to show you the characteristic that it has. Did you hear that? You heard it as it falls off as it goes around? Okay, that's important to know because if you don't know that and you put it in the wrong application, uh, like I said, it can be used to your advantage or it can be used to your detriment. So, now, 416. This is the Sennheiser 416. This is very, very commonly used on movie sets and in voiceover studios because you can put it far away. You don't have to worry about ambient sounds. Uh, sounds coming in from the back. I want to show you what this one sounds like. Now, this microphone, I can't get close to it. Uh, the diaphragm is actually here. So I'm probably six and a half inches away from the diaphragm. I want, you to, I want to show you what it sounds like off axis. So this is the front of the 416. This is about 45 degrees off axis of the 416. This is the 90 degrees off axis. It's pretty astounding, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it just almost completely goes away. And if you get around to the back, let me show you. This is 45 degrees, and this is zero degrees on axis. It's incredibly useful. Now, by contrast, this is the Shure Twinplex. Great switch, thank you there, Mike. Uh, this is the Shure Twinplex, omnidirectional. If we can turn this one on and compare it to this one, I'm sure you noticed the sound of the, the ambient hall. So this one, uh, one of the things it'll do, turn this one up just a little bit. It feels like a little bit softer. Uh, okay, this is, I'm, I'm going to talk all the way around this one and let you hear what it sounds like. Okay, this is zero degrees, this is 45 degrees, this is 90 degrees, this is 135 degrees, and this is 180 degrees. It's pretty amazing. It's wonderful, I'm, and I'm just trying to be as consistent as I could with distance. Uh, it's great when you've got to put a microphone in, you're not sure... Uh, what you're going to encounter and you need it to pick up everything. One of the one of the things you have to be aware of with these, this is the only one I've added a pop filter to, but let me show you now real quickly. The sensitivity to plosives. Okay, immediately you can see if I say Peter Pepper picked a pick, whatever it is. Uh, so you just need to be aware of that. Uh, moving on, and I've got two minutes. This is the R84 ribbon microphone. It's a figure eight microphone. You can hear immediately the difference in like the clarity of this compared to this. Now, if we were in a less ambient space than less noisy space, I could talk into this microphone from here and you would swear that I was as close as I was to that. There is a natural shelving on the top end on a ribbon microphone. 
Are y'all hearing that? I heard, I heard a little static. Oh, it may have just been my headphones. Um, there is a natural shelving on the top end. Y'all aren't hearing that. Okay, good. I'll, I'll ignore it. Okay, I want to show you now the figure eight pattern. Okay, this is the front of the microphone. And, okay, this is zero degrees. This is 45 degrees. You see, it, it changes very little from zero to 45. Now this... Okay, this is 135 degrees and this is 180 degrees. 180, going back through 135. This is coming back 60, 45, 15, and zero degrees on axis. It, situations where this can be incredibly useful. Uh, I had a situation where I was, I had a 120 voice choir and all the percussion players were right in front of them and I had to figure out a way to get the percussion without the bleed from the choir. Most people would reach for a 57 or a dynamic microphone. Uh, I used ribbons in that situation and put them right over that. And what happened is I got the sound of the percussion instruments, but the choir was completely off axis. So another application for this if you're doing like a guitar vocal where somebody is playing and singing at the same time and you really want separation between the acoustic guitar and the voice, if you have this aimed at their voice with the null pointing toward the acoustic guitar, all you're gonna get is reflections from the acoustic guitar and off axis sound. You have another one pointed at the acoustic guitar with their voice in the null and you'll hardly have any bleed between the two. You'll be able to tell it's there, but anyway. I am out of time.